Over and over again, I hear people say that if we replaced gas vehicles with battery electric vehicles, we would completely break the electrical grid. I beg to differ and I have the numbers to back me up. Let's take a look. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I actually started this whole thing out as a bit of a thought experiment, but then I thought, hey, let's just, you know, let's not talk about analogies and stuff. Let's actually get some numbers behind this and try to figure out exactly how difficult it would be to transition from gasoline engine cars to BEV cars. And actually the numbers bear me out that it really isn't going to be that difficult to do. Yes, we will have to increase the electrical grid a bit to add capacity to make it all happen, but it's not going to be as much as we think we need. And also, if we could do it intelligently, we almost won't have to add very much at all. All right, so let's start by taking a look at the numbers here. I'm going to use California as an example, and the year is going to be 2016, simply because that's a year I could get a bunch of statistics. There were not very many battery electric vehicles on the road, and it was prior to the pandemic, so we don't have that weird like kind of dip in the amount of driving and stuff like that. So this seems like a good comparison year. The numbers in general have gone down a bit, both for gasoline usage and for power usage since 2016, but we're sort of looking at the basics here. Here, and it hasn't changed all that much. So I think this is a pretty reasonable thing to do to look at 2016 as the year. So here's one little interesting aside that I found out. I didn't realize this. California is actually only the second highest electrical usage state in the United States behind Texas. Texas actually has the most electricity usage, and that actually makes some sense because Texas is a very, very hot state, and so people are going to run air conditioners much, much more than they do in California, which has a much milder climate. The really interesting factor is that per capita, the electrical usage is fourth lowest in California in the United States. So that means there's only three states that actually have less electricity usage per person than California does. So that's just a little interesting aside there for anyone who happens to find that cool. The next thing that's really important to note here is that California's max electricity capacity is somewhere around 50 gigawatt hours continuous. They don't hit that all the time, but that's the maximum amount they can do on a warm day, etc. So that's, that's really stretching their electrical grid, but it is something that they can handle. All right, so let's look at 2016. So in this comparison year, California used 290,792 gigawatt hours or about 290 terawatt hours of electricity, which comes out to around 796 gigawatt hours a day or about 33 gigawatts continuous. In other words, if you just ran at 33 gigawatts continuously all day, you would generate about 796 gigawatt hours. Next up on the docket is in 2016, the United States used 140. 44.85 billion gallons of gasoline. That's a lot of gasoline. California makes up about 11% of the car market. So just with rough numbers here. So that means that roughly California used about 15.9 billion gallons of gasoline in 2016. Okay, so time for a little bit of math. One gallon of gasoline is equivalent to about 33.4 kilowatt hours of energy. So that means with the amount of gas they used, California used about 532,000 gigawatt hours or 532 terawatt hours of gas energy in that year. And if you look back to our electricity usage, you can see 290 terawatt hours versus 532 terawatt hours doesn't look good, but it actually isn't as bad as we might think. If we divide this number by 365, we get approximately 1,450 gigawatt hours per day for gasoline for Californians to transport themselves. But this is where things start to look a little bit better. You remember that ICE engines are at the maximum about 33% efficient, and I'm being really generous here, they're more like 30% efficient, while battery electric vehicles are around 80% efficient, and honestly, they're more like 85%. So I'm making these numbers not as good as they could be. But anyway, if we use those numbers, we can see 
see that if all the cars in California were to transition to BEVs, they would only require about 601 gigawatt hours per day to charge up, not 1,450 gigawatt hours. So that's a really big difference. And that actually takes it down to less than the number of gigawatt hours per day used for electricity to cool homes or heat homes or run factories, etc. Still, however, this is 75% of California's daily electricity usage. So we're adding another 601 gigawatt hours to the already 796 gigawatt hours per day. So theoretically, we would need to increase the electrical grid by 75% to make this all work. But as I say here, not so fast. We can actually do much better than that. All right, so let's start with this little graph. On October 22nd of 2016, this is what California's energy usage was all day long. So this is the blue line here is what the power needs of Californians was for the whole state for that date, starting at around one o'clock in the morning and going till midnight. So you can see overnight, less and less power usage at about seven o'clock in the morning as people woke up, started going to work, running their air conditioners, whatever else they were doing, power usage went Went up until about seven o'clock in the evening and then it went down again and of course the next day we would cycle back over and it would be kind of a sinusoidal type of graph down here at the bottom we have this gray curve this humpy curve that is solar output for that date in October of 2016. Obviously, this number has gone up since then because there's a lot more solar in California than there used to be, but that doesn't really matter. We're just kind of looking again at generalizations here. But what you can see, of course, is that there's big hump and it gets up to about six or seven gigawatt hours of power generation at the max and then goes back down again. And this orange curve is where things get interesting. This is the curve of energy production that's needed in California, not including solar and wind. So that'd be things like coal, natural gas, nuclear, hydro from the Hoover Dam, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the power that they need. And notice that there's this gigantic dip during the day in the power that's needed besides solar. And then of course it spikes way, way up in the evening as very high as peak energy usage around six or seven o'clock in the evening happens at the same time that the sun goes away. So you've got a pretty pronounced duck curve here, which you know looks like a duck. So that's why it's called a duck curve. All right, so let's stack things up a little bit here. So this green line is roughly what cars would need. If you had 100% BEVs in California, they would need about 24 gigawatts of continuous power to run. And so you would have to add this, and that's why I've kind of doubled this up and forgive these numbers. This is 30,000. This would actually be 40,000. This would be 50,000. So if you added this up, you'd be looking at, oh my gosh, you know, we're looking at like 27,000 plus another 24. So we'd be looking at something like 60,000 megawatt hours or 60 gigawatt hours, which is way up in this area up here. That's well beyond the grid capability capabilities of California right now. But here's where the not so fast comes in. Rather than just charging up all day long, right? What you want to do is something like this. You want to charge heavily at night when there's much less usage in the grid overall. Then you want to really restrict the amount of charging during the day. And then you want to ramp it back up again at night. And again, very, very crudely drawn here, but you get the basic idea. What you're doing is kind of opposing this blue curve with this purple curve. And if you do that, you can get what's up here in in red, and again, remember this is about 50,000 megawatts or 50 gigawatts, you could pretty much create a curve that's more or less flat at around 50 gigawatts, which like I said, the California power grid could already support that, although it would be very taxing for it to do that all the time. But again, if we increase the amount of solar and wind and battery storage, we can increase that max number from 50 gigawatt hours to something like 60 or something like that, which would give us plenty of room. And the really, really big advantage here is look at the this curve. We're no longer talking about a curve that's doing this crazy up and down sort of thing and you have to bring power plants online and take them offline and do this kind of thing where you're doing all this crazy load balancing. You can, if you're clever about charging at the right times, you can actually cause this energy usage all day long to be more or less flat, which means that BEVs could actually help the grid to be more stable. Because remember this orange graph shows that you're having to take power plants offline or reduce their power, then you're having to ramp it up, then you're having to add peaker plants. There's all sorts of stuff that's going on here where if you had just a fairly flat usage requirement, you could keep all of the baseline power just running at a very continuous rate and then add in solar and wind and battery storage on top of that to keep things relatively flat all day long. 
And so while yes, you're definitely putting more stress on the power grid, what you're doing is you're taking off the stress of this like, oh my gosh, we got to ramp up. Oh my gosh, we got to ramp down. Oh my gosh, we got to ramp up. That kind of thing kind of goes away and you can make it much more flat. All right, you might say, that's fantastic. You can go ahead and fix the grid if only everybody charges at just the right time. But how do you make that happen? Well, the obvious way to do that is to cost incentivize things. So what you do, and this is already done in a lot of places, including where I live, we get a very, very low rate overnight when people are not using their electricity as much. So that encourages us very strongly, in fact, we do it, to charge up our car at night. And then of course the rates go up when there's high demand, so people are encouraged very strongly not to charge up during those times. And of course, you can go a lot further than that. You can incentivize things on an almost minute by minute basis. If you improve the software that runs the grid and you improve the communication between the vehicles and the grid. So all of that stuff is quite reasonable. And you also have to remember that there's a really good potential that fleet vehicles are going to be taking over from personal vehicles. If you haven't seen that video, definitely check it out. I'll put the link up in the corner. But anyway, as you have fleet vehicles, you can be even more proactive because fleets are going to be incredibly sensitive to charge times and rates because they of course want to get the lowest rate because that improves their profit. So if you have you know a hundred thousand cars charging you can work out a deal with the power company that you can make sure that you're charging at absolutely the right time and there can be a lot of communication between the grid and between the vehicles. So you can really work on this basically through software and a bit smarter energy grid. You can work this all out and make sure that there is plenty of power at the right times and again help to load balance. And you can even make make this whole thing much more efficient, you could actually reduce the amount of power generation requirement by quite a bit if you start treating these cars as batteries as well. So what you can do is you could think of a car plugged in sort of like the Tesla Powerwall is right now. You can assume that what you can do is you can push energy into it when it's cheap and when it's available, like when there's a lot of power being generated by solar or overnight when not a lot of people are using it. So you charge the cars up then, you charge up your battery storage, your Powerwall, etc. And then when there is a lot of demand, rather than generating power using a power plant, you pull that power out of these battery storage units, you pay the consumer for whatever they're contributing, whether it's from their car or a power wall, and then you're flattening out the curve without having to add very much extra power generation at all, because you're just storing it and then retrieving it and storing it and retrieving it. And that is a really, really good way to reduce the amount of power requirements. So the upshot of all of this is yes, if we can converted all gas cars to BEVs, we would need a lot of electricity to do that. Remember, of course, that we're getting rid of that equivalent amount of electricity in fossil fuels and things, and that BEVs are much more efficient. So overall, we save energy by a lot, and it's much more efficient for our society, but it does put pressure on the electrical grid. But if we do this right, if we charge at the right times, and especially if we use power walls and cars as sources of power, as well as sinks of power, right? So again, if we can pull power out of these things when we need to when they're parked and plugged in and then push it back into them when we don't need the electricity as much, they can actually help to really, really stabilize the electrical grid across a wide, wide range of states and local communities. And of course, it plus solar panels on individuals' houses can provide diffuse power in localized areas rather than having these monolithic power plants that generate power and then have to transmit them all over the place with very large inefficiencies involved. So overall, the transition from from gasoline to BEV could theoretically happen if you waved a magic wand today. Now, of course, this is realistically going to take a half decade to a decade to really, really ramp up. And yes, it is happening that fast. But over that amount of time, electrical generation can come up and can come online at the amount that it needs to to be able to maintain this and to support this amount of BEVs. So it's not going to be that bad and actually BEVs can in fact help the grid rather than hurt it by causing power generation needs to become much less cyclical and much flatter, which is much easier to predict, much easier to produce, and much easier to maintain. So it really isn't gonna be nearly as big a deal as people think, at least according to my calculations. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and thought provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. I've had a lot of fun talking to you all this weekend on Discord. It's been really interesting conversations that we've had, which I think is going to actually generate yet another video in the next couple of days. But anyway, stay tuned for that. And of course, if you want to join the fun, just check out the link in the description. 
And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Tesla bot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget that we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, hmm, interesting with this topic today, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.